She is an ordained nun of the Vedanta Society of Southern California, currently resident at the Vivekananda Retreat in Ridgely, New York. For many years, she's been active in the publication work of the Ramakrishna Order, editing numerous books and articles. She's also written many articles and is the author of two books, The Divine World of the Alvars and Indian Saints and Mystics. The subject of her talk today is Ramakrishna and Mythology. May I welcome you again, Pataji. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahano Bunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvinavadi Tamastuma Vitvishavahai Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Now, if attaining self-knowledge is the goal of human life, why would anyone want to study mythologies? Do they have any relevance for our spiritual life, or are they just merely nice bedtime stories for children? To answer this, we might look at where we are in our spiritual life. If we have attained self-knowledge, or at least if we have a good, solid practice that we believe is taking us there, and we feel we have good control over our mind, then well and good. Then we can ignore the myths. Or in Ramakrishna's illustration, if you feel that you are strong enough to jump, jump straight way to the roof, well and good. <laughs> Or maybe you just like uh, prefer the farmless abstract, abstract, uh, absolute aspect of God. You like to be sugar, not taste sugar. <laughs> but if you're like most people who practice spiritual disciplines and try to focus a restless mind on God while living and working in this difficult world, then you might want to try taking the stairs up to the roof. Then you might like to see how Ramakrishna um, used spiritual myths in, in his spiritual practice. Now we might object, but aren't myths just another form of maya? Aren't we just immersed in duality in those myths? Well, no, there's a difference. Here we can remember Ramakrishna's illustration of the ocean and ice. The ocean represents the absolute Brahman without qualities. The ice represents the forms that the personal God takes to attract the devotees. The ice is made of the same substance as the ocean. They're not different. So here, the realm of the uh, ice is the realm of sacred myths. The realm of sacred myths has for its foundation the the bliss of the absolute Brahman. And that bliss is the love of the personal God for his or her devotees, and the devotee's love for God. The realm of sacred myths is not of this world. It is a spiritual realm. Referring to sacred myths, Joseph Campbell gives another illustration. According to him, all our names and images for God are masks. They signify the ultimate reality that, by definition, transcends language and art. A myth, he says, is a mask of God, too. A metaphor for what lies behind the visible world. In another place, Campbell said, the whole function of mythological and ritual instruction is to transform the person who lives for animal ends into one who lives for cultural and spiritual ends. The individual who teaches these aims, these aspects of life, who really teaches them, is one who has experienced them. Now, such teachers are what we usually refer to as saints who has really experienced these things. Now, it cannot be mere coincidence that India has both a consistent ability to produce great saints, as we all know, as well as 
rich and beautiful mythologies. As Campbell indicates, the two are related. Sacred myths are often revealed to saints in divine visions, such as the visions of, that Black Elk had. But sometimes the saints draw on existing mythologies for their inspiration. Then again, they also inspire new myths through their lives or their writings or both. For instance, Mirabai's heart and soul were immersed in the uh, stories of Krishna. But she, in turn, inspired many more stories about her own life and love of Krishna. And again, inspired by her life and songs, so many women since then have followed and still follow in her footsteps. And so it goes on and on. Saints are inspired by myths, but then their lives also inspire new myths, which in turn inspires others. Now, a sacred myth is a story of a person, event, or deed, whether historical or revealed in a sacred manner, that gives an explanation of or meaning to life for a group of people. Often the story has such great significance for a group, such as the thrice blessed day of the Buddhists, that it is incumbent on the group to remember and celebrate it in some way. And in some cases, its remembrance, ritualization, or reenactment are said to revitalize the power of the initial event. Whether the, his, the, whether the story is historical or not doesn't matter, really doesn't matter. What matters is the significance that the story has for the group and its revelation in the minds of saints and also the power that the story has to change people's lives for the better. For instance, whether, a his, whether or not a historical Rama actually built a historical bridge to Sri Lanka really doesn't matter. <laughs> if, it is, if that story is revealed in the minds of saints, then it is on a higher level true. And if the story of Rama has the power to inspire people and awaken godly qualities in them, like compassion, love for all beings, then that story is to be considered sacred. And again, everything connected with that story is also sacred. Harry M. Buck, the author of a condensed Ramayana in English, you may have seen this book. It's, it's quite old. It's been out for many years. He once said that one of the functions of retelling or performing a myth is anamnesis, which he translates as recollection. He gives this example. At the end of his life, Jesus broke bread in a symbolic act interpreted by Christians to be the inauguration of a sacramental celebration, which we refer to as the Mass nowadays. Jesus used these words, do this for my anamnesis. In the English Bible, this is translated as, do this in remembrance of me. However, as Buck says, more than simple memory is involved. When the devotee participates in this cultic anamnesis, he causes the redemptive event to happen all over again, as it were. Or else you might say that he transcends any temporal barriers that may exist and participates directly in the actions of the deity in his life. Now we have to qualify this just a bit, but then I will shortly qualify my qualifier. <laughs> to a great extent, the anamnesis depends on the faith of the devotee participating or witnessing the, the reenactment. Thousands of such reenactments take place all over the world every day in various religious traditions. But how many people truly receive divine grace from them? Perhaps only a few. For the most part, we can say that only those who have uh, genuine faith in and love for God get any real benefit and can participate directly in the actions of the deity. 
Yet, it is because of these few people, people who can really touch the inner meaning of the, re of the ritual, that it continues to retain its redemptive power. Most religious traditions have rituals and dramas that reenact sacred moments from their spiritual heritage. In the Jewish tradition, Passover is remembered and celebrated every year when families read aloud the story of this event. And the story of Esther is celebrated every year with folk dramas reenacting her heroic life. In the Hindu, Hindu tradition, Stories from the Ramayana and the Bhagavatam are regularly enacted in many places of India. It's a tradition during the monsoon season, in fact, in Vrindavan. In the Christian tradition, besides the celebration of the Mass, Christ's birth, life, and death are also cel celebrated with rituals, oratorios, songs, and plays that reenact scenes from these events. Just, the, just by its very nature, the crash that we see at Christmas time under Christmas trees, this is a, a sort of reenactment. In addition, stories such as Mary's appearance to a peasant at Guadalupe, Guadalupe in Mexico are often dramatized and performed by troops in various places. And here I'm going to qualify my qualifier above, as this really vindicates Buck's statement. Many years ago, someone I know was a very reluctant participant in one of these dramas. She got talked into helping the singers in one of these troops. And in spite of the fact that at the time she was an agnostic and had absolutely no faith at all in the incident that was being dramatized, the, the power of the drama shook her. And her days as, a, as an agnostic were soon over. In some traditions, mythology implies actual participation. It's not passive. For instance, both in the Hindu tradition and in the Christian tradition, there are spiritual practices in which the devotee meditates on a scene from the scriptures. Jesuit priests will meditate on an event in the life of Christ and then imagine that they are there with Christ as his friend and disciple. In this way, they share with Christ and the other disciples the joys and sorrows of the various events of Christ's life. You may have heard, uh, if, you've ever, if you keep up with what happens with the Pope, you may have heard the Pope telling some of the monks, go back, go into a retreat, get, you know, uh, Renew your spiritual life through a retreat now. This is exactly what he's talking about. This is what they do in the, those retreats. Then some Vaishnavites in the Hindu tradition also will meditate on a scene from the Ramayana and Bhagavat, or Bhagavatam. They will imagine that they are a servant or friend or some other person in the divine drama and gradually immerse themselves in a particular scene until they feel that they are actually living that event with Rama or Krishna. As the uh, anthropologist Branislaw Malinowski believed, myth is not merely a story to be told, but it is a reality to be lived. So let's go further with Buck's idea of anamnesis. Now we come to a question. What happens when an incarnation of God participates in a reenactment of a divine myth? If when an ordinary devotee reenacts a myth, the redemptive event can happen all over again, what happens when a divine incarnation reenacts it? There have been at least two great saints or, Hindu, or incarnations of God in the Hindu tradition. Chaitanya and Ramakrishna, who took as the basis of sadhana the reenactment of sacred myths. Chaitanya's sadhanas were focused almost exclusively on the stories of Krishna's life in Vrindavan, while Ramakrishna's sadhanas covered various aspects of Hinduism, as well as aspects of Christianity and Islam. 
we can understand we can understand from the biographies of Chaitanya that the Vaishnava religion was waning during his lifetime, especially in Bengal. But his life and sadhanas created a huge wave of interest in and a revival of that faith. There was so much power, in fact, that within just 50 years of his passing away, Vrindavan and its surrounding areas were transformed from just remote, obscure villages to active pilgrimage centers with the most beautiful temples in northern India. Just within 50 years, think of the power of that. Now, before Chaitanya took monastic vows and renounced the world, he drew a group of devotees around him, and they would often perform plays depicting incidents from Krishna's life. Some years later, he went to, on pilgrimage to Vrindavan, and through visions, he was able to identify places connected with Krishna's life. He then sent Rupa and Sanatana Goswami there to identify further places and also develop them into pilgrimage sites. But during the last 18 years of Chaitanya's life, when he lived in Puri, he became so totally immersed in visions of Krishna's divine play that he hardly had any awareness of the external world around him. He lived and breathed and had his whole being in Krishna's realm. So in the case of Sri Chaitanya, what was the result of his constant participation in the reenactment of this divine myth? But first we might ask, why would he so totally absorb himself in a divine myth, even to the point of losing all connection with the external world? What good does it do for someone to be so totally disconnected from the world? Well, this question implies, of course, that everything in this world has to have a practical value. Does it? <laughs> but if we want to look at it in this, such terms, we can say that his life revealed the secret of divine love as well as its depth. And this love generated such power, a tidal wave of power, in fact, that it is felt even today, even in other countries. Inspired by Chaitanya, by his superhuman love of God, many people have left everything to follow in his path. They have understood that the only thing meaningful in life is to, reveal, is to realize divine love. Another result of Chaitanya's absorption in the mythology of Krishna is that soon after his passing away, his own life became part of the spiritual mythology, a mythology to be meditated on and reenacted to learn the secret of divine love. Now, about 300 years after Chaitanya's passing away, Ramakrishna was born. Due to the Western brand of education that was imposed on Indians at that time, religion again began to wane in India. Many British-educated Hindu youths doubted or totally lost faith in the Hindu religion. Some actively scorned it. Then Ramakrishna came a barely educated idolater. Not the kind of person who could shake up the uh, nation, but that's exactly what he did. Suddenly, Hindus were proud to be Hindus. Inspired by him, they regained faith in their scriptures and in their gods and goddesses. Now, from his birth, Ramakrishna had lived in a world of sacred myths. Both of his parents Kudaram and Chandramani had visions of gods and goddesses, many visions of gods and goddesses. Before Ramakrishna was born, his parents had to leave Kudaram's native village of Dere in West Bengal when the local landlord filed a false lawsuit against the family and seized their property. They could take nothing with them when they left for their new home, not even their family deity. But it seems that his family deity, his family deity was Raghavira, another name for Rama. It seems that Rama 
did not want to be deprived of Kudaram's love and devotion, and he soon devised a way to re-enter new, the new household in Kamarpukar. Once when Kudaram was returning home from a trip to another village, he felt tired and decided to rest under a tree. He soon fell asleep, and in a dream, he saw the child Rama pointing to a spot in a nearby field. Rama told him that he was staying there in the field and asked Kudaram to take him home. When Kudaram woke up, he recognized the field nearby to be the one Rama was pointing to in his dream, and he went to investigate. There at the spot Rama had been pointing to, he saw a sacred Shalagrama Shila, which is a stone symbol of Vishnu. And there also, next to it, was a cobra coiled up, spreading its hood over the stone. Now, from the mythological standpoint, the snake uh, is, seems to be, have been a manifestation of Ananta, the thousand-headed serpent. Vishnu is said to recline on Ananta's body while the serpent spreads its hood over him. <laughs> so without any fear of the snake, Kudaram ran and grabbed the stone, and after examining it, he found that it had the sacred markings of Raghavir on it. Overjoyed, Kudaram took the Shalagrama home and began worshiping it. It's still worshipped even now in the the family shrine in Kamarpukar. Shitala was another goddess, whom, uh, another deity whom Kudaram adored. It is said that he often had visions of this goddess in the form of a little girl. Early in the morning when he would go out to prepare for his daily worship, she would sometimes accompany him and help him pick flowers. So this was the religious atmosphere in which Ramakrishna was born and brought up. Because of the visions and experiences, the whole family felt there was a special grace bestowed on them by the Lord. And they, for that reason, they took their religious duties seriously. When Ramakrishna was just a child, he would often put on plays with his friends, as Chaitanya had done, enacting the stories of Krishna or Rama. Though it may seem that the children were doing it for their amusement, we can understand from Ramakrishna's later that life that for him the purpose was probably more to enter into the world of Krishna or Rama. This became apparent when he once took the part of Shiva in a play on the occasion of Shivaratri. Though just a child, he became so absorbed in the thought of Shiva that he lost all outward consciousness. He became fully merged in Shiva. Again, he often lost outer consciousness when he performed the worship of the family deities. But Ramakrishna's spiritual sadhana began in earnest when he started worshiping the divine mother Kali in the, at the Dakshinishwar temple near Calcutta. His spiritual zeal was so great that as soon as he began worshiping the mother, he did it with complete faith that she was a living deity and he offered himself wholeheartedly to her. Yet it is significant that after practicing intense austerities to have her vision, see it wasn't enough just to worship the image, he wanted the actual vision of her. That what meant that he was actually seeing her alive. But after practicing intense austerities and he still hadn't had her vision, she, he began to question her reality. Are you real mother, he said, or is this all a fiction of the mind, mere poetry without any reality? If you really exist, why can I not see you? Is religion then a fantasy, a mere castle in the air? Unlike most people who wonder if God exists and then do nothing to find out, he never quit trying to have her vision. He, in fact, increased his sadhanas more and more. And at last, when he was literally, literally ready to give up his life for her vision, he got it. 
Yet he was not satisfied even then, simply having the vision of her once. He would not rest until he had the constant vision of her and could see her and talk to her at will. But even then he was not satisfied until he had proven to himself that his visions were not figments of his imagination. Again, most people would have rested on their laurels right there, but he did not. Why? He wanted to see God in many forms and in many aspects, and he wanted to love God in various relationships. In his biography of Ramakrishna, Swami Sardananda raises this very question. Why did the master continue practicing sadhana even after attaining the, the constant vision of the Divine Mother? We did not hesitate to ask him about it. The master said in reply, one who lives near the sea sometimes has a desire to find out how many pearls are hidden in the ocean depths. Similarly, after realizing the Divine Mother and being constantly near her, I thought, that I should see her multiple forms. If I had a desire to see her in a particular way, I would import in her with a longing heart. Then the gracious mother would supply whatever was necessary to experience that form, make me practice that sadhana, and reveal herself to me accordingly. Thus I practice sadhanas belonging to various faiths. Now, it seems also from other things Ramakrishna said that the Divine Mother made him practice those sadhanas with a definite purpose, to show the world that they are all true and that they all lead to the same goal. With regard to Kali, Ramakrishna adored her as a child adores its mother. For Ramakrishna, Kali was always his mother. This attitude in Hinduism is called apatyabhava, the attitude of a child towards its divine mother or father. Generally, generally the parent is the protector or nourisher, and nourisher of the child. So to worship God in this attitude means to put one's full trust in God, to fully surrender to God, and this is exactly what Ramakrishna did. However, according to... Um, the Gurya Vaishnava path of Hinduism, there are five other attitudes that one can establish with God. These attitudes are based on the relationships that Krishna had with his friends and villagers and family in Vrindavan. Apachabhava is not included in the Gurya Vaishnava sadhanas because it was not exemplified in Krishna's life in Vrindavan. The first of these, we've gone through this before. I'll just go through this quickly. The first of these five Vaishnava attitudes is called Shantabhava, the serene attitude, the calm attitude. The next is Daisyabhava, the attitude of the servant towards the divine master. Then there is Sakyabhava, the attitude of a friend toward the divine friend. And next comes Vatsalya Bhava, the attitude of a mother or father for their beloved divine child, so, like Yashoda's love for baby Krishna. And the last attitude is called Modura Bhava, the attitude of a woman lover for her divine beloved. Now going back to Ramakrishna's childhood days, we can recall that he was very devoted to his, the family deities, and especially Raghavir. And according to Swami Sardananda, at that time, Ramakrishna worshipped Raghavir with the attitude of Daisyabhava, the attitude of a servant towards the master. But after Ramakrishna had the, had the vision of the Divine Mother, he decided he again turned to the worship of Rama, this time to perfect that attitude and carry it to its full conclusion. Now, as Hanuman, the great monkey hero, is considered the ideal devotee of, of Rama and the best exemplar of Daisyabhava, Ramakrishna became another Hanuman in every way. Now, we should keep in mind that 
in Hindu in the Hindu tradition, Hanuman is not regarded as simply a monkey. He is also had uh, he is also said to have had um, human qualities. Like he was the prime minister of the monkey king. He was supposed to be very intelligent and very highly educated. Now, as Ramakrishna described it. By constant meditation on the glorious character of, Ram, of Hanuman, I totally forgot my own identity. The daily, my daily life and style of food came to resemble those of Hanuman. I did not feign them. They came naturally to me. I tied my cloth around the waist, letting a portion of it hang down in the form of a tail. And I jumped from place to place instead of walking. I lived on fruits and roots, and I, these I preferred on, without peeling. <laughs> I passed most of the time on trees, calling out in a solemn voice the name of Rama. My eyes looked restless like those of a monkey. And most wonderful of all, the end of my backbone extended by about an inch <laughs> from sitting, squatting like a, a, a monkey. It gradually resumed its former size after the phase of, that phase of the mind had passed on the completion of that sadhana. In short, everything about me was more like a monkey than a human being. Now soon afterwards, Ramakrishna was blessed with a vision of Rama's consort, Sita, who merged into him. And it is said that, she, that as she merged into him, she she told him, I bequeath to you my smile. And I can imagine that Sita was smiling and maybe even laughing a little watching Rama, Ramakrishna jumping around like a monkey. <laughs> now, after that, he often had visions of Sita and Rama. For example, once he said, sometimes when the mind descended from the absolute plane to the Leela, I would meditate day and night on Sita and Rama. At those times, I would constantly behold the forms of Sita and Rama. Now, before we go on to his other sadhanas, let's stop and look at this one for a moment, as the same question will arise when we come to his other sadhanas, especially the Madura, Madura Bhava sadhana. Ramakrishna's aim in this sadhana was to enter a mythological realm, the spiritual realm of Rama, Sita, and Hanuman. This realm is not on a physical plane. It is on a divine spiritual plane. So why then did he not do this exclusively by meditation as other sadhakas were doing it? Here in this sadhana of Hanuman, we see that Ramakrishna wanted to live 100% is Hanuman. Well, that's just it. He wanted to put in 100% in order to see God. He wanted to see God in any way possible. Did everyone, even his own family, think he was crazy? Yes, and he could care less. God was all he cared about. And we can understand this because, as he put it, there was no theft in the chamber of his mind. That is, there was no hypocrisy in his mind. It was 100% to God. Moreover, as Ramakrishna himself said, his actions in his Hanuman sadhana, hasadhana came naturally to him. He did not feign them. So from this, we can understand that he was moving under a divine impulse. He was so totally surrendered to the Divine Mother that all his actions came from her. But then why would the Divine Mother have him turn himself physically into a monkey? I think we can understand it this way, that he was doing this sadhana for all those spiritual aspirants in the future who wanted to perform it. The path had become overgrown with weeds, you might say, and difficult to traverse. So he was clearing the weeds away to make it easier for others to travel that path in the future. 
So did he expect us to do what he had done? Did he expect us to live in trees and eat roots and unpeeled fruits? <laughs> no. As we can recall, in later years, Ramakrishna told his disciples, I did, six, I did 16 parts, now you do one part. So he understood that his sadhana had been for others. It had made it easier for others to follow. And this goes for the other attitudes he took up also, Madhura Bhava and the others. So this is how Ramakrishna practiced all the sadhanas he took up with 100% of his mind and with absolute 100% devotion and faith. Faith in what he was doing, faith in God, and faith in the goal he wanted to attain. Swami Saradananda said that Ramakrishna also took up the discipline of Sakya Bhava, the attitude of a friend for Krishna. But unfortunately, the details of this sadhana are not known. According to Swami Premananda, Ramakrishna at one time took on the role of Balaram, Krishna's elder brother, which is a type of Sakya Bhava. But again, the details of this sadhana are not known. It's very unfortunate because this is a very beautiful sadhana. Ramakrishna's practice of Vatsalya Bhava, the attitude of a parent towards the divine child, took a slightly different turn. Here, according to Swami Sardananda, he seemed to have had visions of Ramlila, the child Rama, before he was initiated into the sadhana. When a Ramayat monk came to Dakshineshwar with an image of Ramlila, Ramakrishna began seeing Ramlila, playing and talking to him. Previously, previously he said he had been averse to taking on a, a maternal mood a feminine mood for sadhana. But these visions awakened a, a, a maternal mood in him. He felt intense love for Ramlala as a mother feels for her child. And he soon asked the Ramayat monk to initiate him with a matcha conforming to that mood. And his perfection of that mood at Vatsaya Bhava was basically immediate. He quickly had the constant vision of Ramlila walking and playing with him. He was Ramlila was said to be very naughty too. <laughs> and then he had the realization that Rama, who is a son of Dasharatha, is in every being. The same Rama is immanent in the universe and yet transcends it. Now it seems Ramakrishna felt he needed the initiation to perfect that mood. Now, to perfect the next sadhana of Madhura Bhava, the attitude of a woman lover towards the divine beloved, Ramakrishna became a woman, again in every way. He dressed as a woman, spoke as a woman, thought as, moved as a woman, and even thought as a woman. In fact, whether in the waking state or in the dream state, he totally forget, forgot that he was a man. First, he took up the attitude of a female friend of the Divine Mother. Dressed in a sari and jewelry, he would fan her image and perform other services and also beg her to give him Krishna as his beloved. And gradually for this mood, which is considered the highest mood in devotional sadhana, Ramakrishna began to suffer the terrible pangs of separation from the Lord. His longing for Krishna was, soon became unbearable. As Swami Sardananda wrote, the master told us that sometimes drops of blood oozed from the pores of his body because of the fierce pain of separation from Krishna. And owing to the intensity of his anguish, his senses sometimes stopped, stopped functioning and he looked like a corpse. At times, the joints of his body seem to become loose or almost dislocated. We should also note that these descriptions of Ramakrishna are exactly like the descriptions of Sri Chaitanya during his um, ecstasies. When at last Ramakrishna had the vision of Krishna, Krishna's form merged into him, as had all the other forms of gods and goddesses. 
he would then feel that he was Krishna, or again, he would see Krishna in all things and beings. Swami Sardananda also mentions that at one time, Ramakrishna practiced the sadhana of Shivoham, that is, I am Shiva. In this state, he would dance in ecstasy, repeating Shivoham, Shivoham, I am Shiva, I am Shiva. Now, at the conclusion of each of Ramakrishna's sadhanas, he had a vision or visions in accordance with the mood of that sadhana. Only then would that mood subside. But until that mood, he had those visions, he was 100% in that mood, in the intensity of that mood. However, after, even after uh, the mood subsided, when he had had the vision, it could and often did come back at a moment's, at the least suggestion. Now, what is the common thread running through these sadhanas? In each of them, Ramakrishna took up a particular relationship with God and also took upon himself the role of a character from sacred mythology conforming to that relationship, and he turned himself in every way into that character. So this is where the role of reenactment of divine myths in sadhana comes in. To reenact a, a sacred myth is to take the part of a character in that myth and to identify with that character so completely that one becomes the character. One then enters the divine world of that myth. This is normally done through meditation. But after Ramakrishna had completed his sadhanas, meditation for him was redundant. He had such a refined and purified perception of the spiritual realm that he did not have to enter it through meditation. He continuously lived on a spiritual plane, and he was able to enter any mythical realm he liked at any time. So his absorption in mythical roles did not end with the end of his sadhanas. On the contrary, after he completed his sadhanas, the line between this world and the spiritual realm was sometimes not there for him. The following incident presents a good illustration of this. One day, Motobabu, Motobabu was then, at that time, the, uh, the in charge of the Dakshinishwar temple in and he was very he loved Ramakrishna very much. One day he was Motababa was returning to his Calcutta resident residence in his deluxe um, carriage and he was bringing Ramakrishna with him. He was very very wealthy. When the carriage reached Chitpur road Ramakrishna had a wonderful vision. He felt that he had become Sita and that Ravana was kidnapping him. So this is part of the story of the, of the Ramayana. The, the demon king uh, Ravana kidnaps Sita in his, his, uh, his chariot. And then Rama has, has to go find her and, and, and with much difficulty and then kill the demon and save Sita. So he felt that he had become Sita, and Ravana was kidnapping him. So seized by this idea, he merged into Samadhi. But just then, the horses of Motobabu's carriage tore loose from their reins and stumbled and fell. Motha could not understand the reason for this mishap. When Ramakrishna returned to normal consciousness, Motha told him about the accident with the horses. And, Shri, and Ramakrishna then said, while in ecstasy, he perceived that Ravana was kidnapping him, him and that Jataya, now Jataya was this a huge vulture. He was a vulture king. And he was loved Rama and Sita very much. So seeing Rama had been uh, enticed away that was the whole plan, that uh, Ravana enticed Rama away to get to, to get a find, get this golden deer. And while Rama is away, 
Ravana kidnaps, grabs Sita and takes her in his uh, chariot. But this big vulture, Jatayu, loved Rama and Sita very much, and he was there, and he saw this happening, and he said, no, no way Sita's getting away with, with uh, this. So Jataya goes and uh, attacks Ravana's chariot and tries to destroy it. But unfortunately, he, Ravana kills him and carries away Sita. But in meanwhile, he did a great damage to this chariot. <laughs> now, after hearing this story, Mother said, Father, how difficult it is even to go with you through the street. <laughs> but we don't hear Mother Baba's reaction to being placed in the position of Ravana. <laughs> now, here we can say that this also validates Buck's idea of anamnesis. And as, as Buck said, when the devotee participates in the cultic anamnesis, he causes the redemptive event to happen all over again. Or else you might say that he transcends any temporal barriers that may exist and participates directly in the actions of the deity in his life. <laughs> this is a perfect illustration. <laughs> we should also remember that besides Hindu sadhanas, Ramakrishna also practiced sadhanas of um, the Christian and Muslim faith. In each case, he became so totally absorbed in that particular sadhana that all Hindu impressions were completely wiped out of his mind for that time. And in each case, he realized God through that sadhana. According to Swami Sardananda, while practicing Islam, the master first had a vision of a radiant being who looked grave and had a long beard. Then he experienced the cosmic Saguna Brahman, that is Brahman with qualities. And finally, his mind merged in the absolute Nirguna Brahman. Again, at the time of his Christian sadhana, he had the vision of a handsome man who belonged to a different race. Swami Sardananda wrote, the master was charmed by the unique divine expression on his serene face and wondered who he could be. Very soon after that, the figure drew near him and a voice from within told him, this is Jesus Christ, the great yogi, the loving son of God who is one with his father who shed his heart's blood and suffered torture for the salvation of humanity. Then the God-man Jesus embraced the master and merged into him. In ecstasy, the master lost external consciousness and his mind remained united with Saguna Brahman, Brahman with qualities for some time. With this vision, the master became convinced that Jesus was truly a divine incarnation. Now, I think we can say with some conviction that the secret or essence of Ramakrishna's absorption in divine mist was divine love. This is because, as we said before, the realm of sacred mists is one of divine bliss and love. It is the love of God for his or her devotees and also the devotees' love for God. And in Ramakrishna's case, if God was going to assume a form, his own form, as Ramakrishna, then he was going to have a relationship of love with all the other forms of God. In fact, Ramakrishna was irresistibly drawn to them in various loving relationships. Moreover, through those same relationships with God, Ramakrishna created a relationship of love with each of his disciples, many of whom were recognized by him to be companions of previous incarnations. For instance, Swami Sardananda and Swami Ramakrishna Nanda, he said, were, had been uh, companions of Jesus Christ in their previous birth. And we know that um, Ramakrishna had this maternal Vatsalya Bhava mood towards Swami Brahmananda, whom he regarded as, as baby Gopala. And he was, Ramakrishna took on a relationship of a friend with Swami Vivekananda, a Sakyabhava. 
Now, earlier, the question was asked, what happens when an incarnation of God participates in a reenactment of a divine myth? If when a devotee reenacts a myth, the redemptive event can happen all over again, what kind of power is released when a divine incarnation reenacts it? First of all, as we said before, as Ramakrishna's sadhanas were done for others, he was able to clear the paths and make it easier for others to follow those paths. Then just as Chaitanya became the object of meditation for people's devotional life after his passing away, so also we see this happening with Ramakrishna. Now Ramakrishna has become the focus for many people's devotional life. He has become the deity, the incarnation to be worshipped. People meditate on his form and also on the incidents of his life. The Dakshinishwar temple itself has become a place of pilgrimage, as also his birthplace in Kamarpukur. Moreover, poets, artists, and musicians have found a wealth of inspiration from his life, just as they did with Sri Chaitanya's life. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the composer Philip Glass. He's written a beautiful oratorio on the last days of Ramakrishna called The Passion of Ramakrishna. It's a be very beautiful. So the great worshiper Ramakrishna has now become the worshipped. But most importantly, just as Chaitanya created a tidal wave of love for God, so did Ramakrishna, and Ramakrishna's tidal wave has reached all over the world within just a few years of his passing away. Again, while Chaitanya revived one sacred myth, Ramakrishna breathed life into myriads of myths. Thus, he opened up the whole world of sacred mythology for all people everywhere. He is like a doorway to the spiritual realms, to the, to the sacred myths. Through Ramakrishna, we are able to enter various spiritual planes, all through the power of his sadhanas. Finally, just as Ramakrishna cried for God, so also did he cry for his, later cry for his devotees. In fact, as Swami Akandananda once said, that cry has not ended there. It is still ringing through the air and shall continue for eons. So Ramakrishna continues to call people to join the divine Leela. And just as he took on a particular relationship of love with each aspect of God, so also does he take on a relationship of love with each one of us. In this way, he is attracting devotees all over the world through every aspect of God. Thank you. Has a question? Please raise your hand, and you can come to the front. Pranam. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Tagore mentioned that when we read the scriptures, uh, take off the head and the tail. <laughs> what did he mean by that? Actually, he was talking more to the um, Brahma devotees than who who they only believed in God without form. They believed in Saguna Brahman, God with qualities, uh, but without form. So. He was telling them, okay, you don't have to accept the forms, but uh, accept, like he said, accept the, um, the intensity of the devotion. So, like he, he said, accept the mood of Radha, accept, accept the, her love and longing for God. You don't have to think of her, you know, as you know, her and Krishna or anything like that. But accept, uh, accept her mood, accept her longing for God. Be inspired by that longing so that you can uh, long for God like that. 
I think that that's what he meant. Okay. I get it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for leading us in that really uh, inspirational talk. Uh, so, Sri Ramakrishna ji, uh, so did he ultimately get to a point where he transcended beyond uh, Brahma with the form? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I didn't mention that. After he finished these devotional sadhanas, he then... Um, took on Advaita Sarana. He met uh, his, uh, the Divine Mother arranged all these things. Mm -hmm. So after he finished his devotional sadhana, she was, she was uh, pleased. That <laughs> she saw that he had finished all these devotional sadhana. She arranged for a Vedanta monk, sannyasin, to come. And he, seeing Ramakrishna, he understood through some vision or something, through the Divine Mother's grace, that Ramakrishna was the perfect person to take up uh, Advaita Vedanta. So he, he, he went to Ramakrishna. I mean, no, the gurus don't do, usually do that. The disciples go to the gurus. But the, this here the guru goes to and said, would you like to take up Advaita Vedanta? <laughs> And Ramakrishna says, let me ask my mother, <laughs> the Divine Mother. <laughs> so he went to the temple said, and she says, yes, yes, I've arranged for him to come for you. <laughs> so he took up uh, the sadhana of Advaita Vedanta and uh, he was initiated into sannyasthan and, um, and he, the Totapuri was the name of the guru. He gave him the instructions. Within three days, he was in Nirvakapa Samadhi, the highest state of. So, and then um, after that, uh, after Totapuri stayed on for a while and, and enjoyed Ramakrishna's company, and Ramakrishna enjoyed his company. And, but after Totapuri left, Ramakrishna. Um, remained in this Nirvikapa state for six months. Uh, the Divine Mother again arranged for some monk to come to save his body, otherwise his body would not have lasted. The, 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 the monk would beat on him and beat on him and he'd put down some food and water down Ramakrishna's throat and the Ramakrishna would immediately go back into Nirvikapa Samadhi. So for six months that went on. So, very much so. Yeah, the Divine Mother was not going to let him go without, <laughs> without the whole range <laughs> of, of, of uh, the sadhanas. Thank you. <laughs> that was also done for us, that sadhana. Mm -hmm. And of course, after six months of that remaining in Nirvakapa Samadhi, his body was in very bad shape <laughs> and, and uh, but it, it you know the divine mother kept it <laughs> hi uh, hi good morning um i have one question it wasn't related to the talk but in general like if you have a natural tendency towards like bhakti yoga oh, um, uh, you have a, what if you have a natural tendency towards bhakti yoga to what towards bhakti yoga Bhakti yoga. Yep. Um, how does one then acquire like jnana yoga or the other forms of yoga? Well, karma yoga is uh, you can. Most people do karma yoga and, and connection also with the other uh, with bhakti yoga, jnana yoga. You can combine them all. Uh, Jnana Yoga, Swami Sardananda has a chapter at the beginning of where he talks about um, Rama, when Ramakrishna starts his sadhanas. Swami Sardananda has a chapter where he describes how uh, bhakti yoga, the worship of God with, with 
qualities, divine forms and qualities, how that can lead to jnana yoga. It's um, basically, in bhakti yoga, the ultimate um, aim, and as we saw this in Ramakrishna's life too, the ultimate aim is to be merged with the Lord, even the, the, Lord, the beloved Lord. You know, you there because the Lord is in within you anyway. You are merged with it with that. You're thinking of the Lord as a separate being in order to attain that love, but when that love grows and grows and grows, you don't want separation. Mm -hmm. You want to be united with that beloved all the time, and that so that itself that longing to be not be separated gradually it takes you to jnana yoga. To, it's, it's, it's a natural uh, conclusion. It's, Thank you. <laughs> okay. Mataji, again, uh, a thousand thanks for taking us through this fascinating subject. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should I do a closing? Yes. <coughs> Om Purnamata Purnamitang Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti